Hello and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Vaughan Gething, the Health Minister for Wales, and I'm here to deliver today's regular update from the Welsh Government on coronavirus. Now, obviously, over the last few days, we've had a number of significant changes to testing, increasing who can be tested in Wales, and equally how they can get a test. I'll run through those changes today. Last week, I published our Test, Trace, Protect plan, which will help us to move into the next phase of our response to the virus, helping us to quickly find new hotspots of the disease and to isolate people who become infected. The changes follow new advice from the four chief medical officers across the UK yesterday that people who have lost their sense of smell uh, or taste should self-isolate. Loss of smell is now recognised to be a symptom of coronavirus. I want to start with care home testing. As I've said a number of occasions before, our testing plan is based on scientific evidence, which continues to evolve as we learn more about the disease. Today, I've published the latest scientific advice provided to Welsh ministers, which helped to inform the changes to our policy that I made on testing in care homes on this weekend. We've changed our testing regime in care homes so that testing will be available to all residents and staff who have not previously tested positive in homes where there is an ongoing outbreak. Testing will be offered to all symptomatic and asymptomatic staff and residents. Those are people who don't have symptoms. Those people who have never tested positive for coronavirus, even where the home has not reported any cases. And when the new antibody test is available, it will be available to care home staff. But testing is only one part of our plan to support care homes. We're providing extra nursing support where it is needed. PPE is, is being made available to all care homes and it's free from the Welsh Government. And we provided extra guidance about cleaning and hygiene to prevent the spread of coronavirus. We've also, as you'll be aware, made an initial £40 million available to help the adult care sector with the additional costs associated with the pandemic. Now, on critical workers, I'm very pleased that we've been able to resolve data issues that now enable us to join the UK website for booking tests. All critical workers in Wales who now need a test can now use the UK website to book a home testing kit. It will soon be extended to include the option of booking a slot at one of the drive-through testing centres we have available across Wales, the eight mobile testing units and the 20 community testing units across Wales. In the meantime, the existing local referral arrangements with Public Health Wales and local health boards all remain in place. Now, in terms of testing for the general public, everyone with symptoms of coronavirus, including the loss of smell and or taste, can request a home testing kit using the new UK-wide website booking system. A national 1119 bilingual telephone system is also available for people to order a home testing kit. And this is a real step forward in increasing coronavirus testing and will help us to identify where the virus is and how it is spreading across Wales. We anticipate that there will be a higher level of demand for home testing kits over the first few days. The UK government has confirmed that priority will be given to home testing kits for critical workers and it will be working to further increase home testing capacity for the public. Now, in setting out Test, Trace, Protect, uh, uh, we're going to be undertaking a range of pilots. So the changes to testing are the first part of the Test, Trace, Protect plan. The second part is to develop a nationwide system of contact tracing so we can track the progression of the disease by tracing who each person with coronavirus has been in contact with. And we will pilot contact tracing in four health board areas. And those are Cumtaf Morganog, Powys, Betty Cadwallader and Howell Var. Each pilot will be delivered with a local authority and their staff. The trials will run for two weeks and are small scale. They will test the key aspects, including workforce roles and training, contact volumes, clinical support, data capture and information flow. Scenario planning and arrange to support people who need help 
to self-isolate. The second week of the trial will also help us to test a new Orwell's contact tracing software system, which will support health boards and local authorities to carry out contact tracing on a larger scale. But our message to the public today uh, is to continue to stay at home. If you leave for one of the permitted reasons, follow the social distancing rules and stay local, stay safe. Thank you. I'll be happy now to take questions and I have the list of journalists in front of me and we're going to start with Teleri Glyn jones from BBC Wales. Good afternoon, Minister. Thank you very much. Um, so it's today's the first day that people can apply for tests online uh, with Wales working with the UK government. It's fair to say there are some teething problems. I'm on the website now and it says test sites in Wales not available and request a home kit also not available. Um, what's your assessment of what's going wrong? Is it that is it um, that high demand, as you say, and kind of does it need clarification on who is eligible? Are there people who may not be eligible applying for these tests, do you think? Well, I think there are two different things. The first is, as I said in my statement, there will be a high level of demand in the first few days. And we'll also need to work through that with the UK government who are providing this facility for each of the four nations. So we need to make sure that there is the right sort of capacity and as we increase it means that people can actually order the tests that they're looking for. I also set up that we'll be looking to integrate this uh, crucially with the critical workers with the other testing infrastructure we have here in Wales. Uh, and I think the, the second point about the value of testing is something that, that we're deliberately looking to set out to make sure that the access is improved, to make sure that we do understand the teething problems that exist as you'd expect us to, and to make sure we're ready for test, trace, protect when it's going to need to be undertaken on a much larger level. Thank you. And um, you also mentioned your scientific advice, which has been published today. In it, it says um, the virus is very likely to decay very quickly in a few minutes in air and on surfaces when exposed to sunlight. This adds to the evidence that outdoor environments are highly likely to be a lower risk of transmission. If that's the case, isn't that a reason to allow the public to meet loved ones outside like they can do in England and in Northern Ireland? Well, this is the developing evidence that we're receiving, and obviously we're reviewing our rules on lockdown every three weeks as we're required to by the law that's been introduced. And so we'll need to think about what that then means, not just about being outside, but who you're right out with and the level of contact you have. So these are active considerations, and the evidence we publish today, as I say, helps to inform not just the public debate, but the very real debate that ministers are having with our advisers on how we continue to take a deliberately cautious approach to unlocking the lockdown measures to make sure we don't risk the health and safety of the people of Wales. And the hard-won gains that the people of Wales have delivered are not thrown away by taking uh, a less than cautious approach to moving forward. Uh, and the deliberate publication of this information, and I want to do it every week on a Tuesday morning, is designed to help inform the public so that they can see for themselves the sort of advice we're getting and how it really does underpin our choices as ministers. Thank you, Teleri. Uh, I've now got James Crichton-Smith at ITV Wales. Minister, thank you. Um, we're hearing from GP surgeries across the country that a number of people have wrongly been sent shielding letters. Do you accept there may be people sitting at home worried for their health after getting a shielding letter who may not even need one? Well, it is possible that some people will have been sent uh, incorrectly a shielding letter. We don't think that there's a system-wide uh, failure and there are large categories of people who got the wrong letter. However, we did anticipate that when sending out collectively about 121,000 letters, it's possible that some may have gone to the wrong person. Now, within this, and I've tried to make this clear previously, but I'm happy to have the opportunity again, if you believe that you've been sent uh, the wrong letter and you shouldn't be in the shielded category there's a specific area on the Welsh Government advice that covers shielding letters that takes you through what to do and who to contact if you do think you're in the wrong category. Do you know how many people have actually been sent a shielding letter who don't need them? Well that would be an impossible question for me to give you an answer to James because 
For people who have been sent a letter incorrectly, they'll need to look at the letter, to look at the categories of people who need to shield, to understand their own circumstances, and to discuss that with health and care professionals who are providing care, treatment and support for them. But as of yet, I've only had literally a handful of instances brought to me. So as I say, we don't believe it's a system-wide issue. And there is clear advice on the Welsh Government website in the specific section on shielding letters for people to go to and to provide the reassurance they'll be looking for. But equally for all those people who are shielding, I'm really pleased to say that the evidence is it's made a real difference in keeping those people safe. And that, after all, is what underpins each of the choices that I and my Welsh Government colleagues are taking. Thank you, James. We've now got Adam Hale from the Press Association. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, so the loss of taste and smell has been added to the official list of proven virus symptoms. Um, but there are other symptoms that scientists in the UK say could indicate proven virus. The same ones that I've talked about uh, and being a possible uh, symptom beforehand. These other symptoms uh, include uh, aches, pains, chills, tiredness, headaches and diarrhoea. Can you explain why it would not be suitable uh, to add those possible symptoms to the official list uh, before there is consensus from advisors um, if they could uh, eventually prove to be proper symptoms down the line? Well, this is part of the challenge that I've tried to honestly reflect in each of the choices that we've made when we've been asked about the evidence that underpins our choices and the advice we get. We know more about coronavirus, coronavirus now than we did a week ago a lot more than we knew about coronavirus six weeks or even three months ago. And as the evidence base changes, it's really important that we are prepared to change the choices we make on behalf of the people of Wales, because the advice will change as a scientific evidence base continues to build. Uh, yesterday's change was made following agreement between the four chief medical officers across the UK. And it's important that we do have a process that isn't simply about finding a group of people that you happen to agree with because in every area of life where there are professionals people don't necessarily agree doctors sometimes disagree on treating options in the field i used to be in i definitely know that lawyers sometimes disagree on what the right answer is with the same set of facts what we are doing as ministers though, is looking at the advice we get from our chief medical officers from our scientific advisors and we then have to make choices and that's what we will continue to do and as i've said to be really open here in wales by publishing that regular summary of the advice that we're receiving but as i say it's entirely possible that in the future there'll be a different choice made as we learn more as we understand more about how coronavirus affects people and the sort of signs that we should be looking for thank you and uh we've heard before from the chief medical officer about how uh, Wales would be looking at how other nations tackle uh, the virus and um, that would inform what decisions are taken over here. Did looking elsewhere around the world uh, help form the latest uh, changes to extend testing to all care homes in Wales and indeed this decision to add lots of tips of smell to the official list? Well, we continue to look around the world at all the different responses to coronavirus. We were doing that from the outset and we'll continue to look, especially as other countries are slightly further ahead of us in easing their lockdown measures. We definitely want to understand the sort of risks uh, that that implies for us in Wales in making those choices. When it comes to how we're making cho different choices about our scientific evidence base, then yes, we'll continue to look around the world as well. What I've published today is a consensus statement from our own technical advisory group that helped to underpin the evidence on care home testing. And that is, it's always going to be a blend of our information and understanding of what takes place within the UK, as well as looking further afield. Uh, but broadly, the evidence that we have to underpin that change in care home testing policy comes from our own scientists within the UK and our experience from the UK care home uh, setting. So uh, I hope that's helpful about setting out how we get to the point we are, but equally, as I said in answer to other questions, about the fact that you can expect to see a regular publication to help inform you and the wider public on how and why we're making different choices as ministers. Thank you, Adam. I've now got Mark Smith from Wales Online. Uh, thank you very much, Health Minister. Um, yesterday marked 10 days since residents on the Isle of Wight um, were invited to test the NHS app um, at the heart of the coronavirus test, track and trace strategy. Um, has the Welsh Government um, been given any insight into how the trial has gone um, and whether there were any major teething problems with it? 
Uh, well, we have uh, an official from the Welsh Government who's involved in some of the architecture and reporting around the development of the NHS X app, because this is an area where, uh, unlike others, uh, this is an area where the four nations of the UK are definitely interested in what this looks like. Now, from my point of view here in Wales, if the NHS X app works, then as I've said before, I'd want us to be part of it. I'm meeting with, virtually of course, with other Cabinet Health Ministers uh, later this week, and I'll expect we'll have a discussion about the up-to-date position on that trial, and it really will depend on the continuing progress of that trial, about whether we think it's something that we can roll out and should roll out in other parts of the UK, and I'll have a decision to make then. But I'm still starting from the point of view that if the app works, I expect there will be teething uh, challenges about how uh, how it's actually uh, put in use by the public, as well as the technical side about how, the, if you like, the uh, the technical workings of the app itself uh, progress, uh, and I'll want to understand how useful that'll be to add to the other parts of our system uh, for contact tracing as part of test, trace and protect. Thank you, uh, thank you, Roger. And secondly, um, there are concerns among um, virology experts that some of these home coronavirus tests will be sent off to non-accredited labs run by volunteers. Um, could you please clarify where the tests will be analysed and by whom, and perhaps provide some reassurance about the, um, the whole process? Okay, so in terms of the public, it shouldn't matter how you order your test. Uh, the point is there should be reassurance in the system. The home testing kits are part of a UK-wide contract that the UK government is delivering for the whole of the UK. So they'll be tested in... Uh, the Lighthouse Labs in England, the kits will be sent out, people will administer the tests themselves, they'll then go back, they'll be tested, and the results will be provided. And crucially now, the data from that test will go into our own health system here as well. Because part of our challenge in not taking up the previous UK testing offer was that we didn't know the results, and we wouldn't have known. We'd have known people had a test, but not what the outcome of that result is. And to make test, trace, protect work, it's really important that our health and care system understands what the result of that test is. So the assurance in the testing regime for home testing kits rests with the UK government. Uh, and at this point in time, I haven't had the sort of detail of concerns you've had raised with you. Uh, but of course, we'll want to continue to assure ourselves in each UK country that there's proper value and there are real standards being set in the way those tests are being run. The other testing capacity that we report on here in Wales, who over 5,000 tests available that we describe in Wales, those are tests that are run in our labs here in Wales. We use a slightly different test, uh, and so there we've got assurance that comes from our own system here in Wales. I hope that's helpful in setting up the differences in how tests are done, but for the public, it really shouldn't make any difference. You should get a test, be able to take it, either or either by someone else delivering it for you or by you actually self-administering the test, and then you should have reassurance the test itself is accurate. Okay, I've now got, th thank you, Mark, I've now got uh, Mike Hughes from LBC. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, the guidance uh, that has been published today has now revised the R rate in Wales up to between 07 and one, and they say this was largely driven by an increase in infections in hospitals and care homes. On care homes, isn't an increase in infection a sign that adequate protections in that sector were not put in place quick enough? Well, I'm not sure that you can make that assessment because actually we're still seeing a decline in the rate of coronavirus in Wales. The challenge is about how quickly it's actually declining compared to the previous week. Now, within care homes, we know there's an environment where there's a challenge about people coming in and out of those care homes. That's largely staff, because as you know, since lockdown, there are hardly any visits allowed into care homes. And that's why in the summary of evidence around care home testing, you'll note the points that are made, not just about staff and consider how they behave, but the points about infection prevention and control measures, which are not about testing, but actually how people behave, how the environment is cleaned and protected. Uh, but crucially then, also about making sure that the testing is provided to the care home rather than trying to deliver residents to a different testing centre. I think the challenge is about how quickly we've acted at various points in time, rather hard to deal with in the here and now, because we'll have a backward-looking inquiry at some point, and it's important that we do, so we can all understand what we've chosen to do at various points in the pandemic, 
and what that's then meant for residents. In the here and now, though, as I said in the publication of the evidence paper today, we're making choices based upon the evidence at the time, and if the evidence supports a change in position, then we'll make that change as we have done in the last few days. We'll continue to learn and continue to change and shift our position. And as I say, I fully expect uh, to be responding to a future inquiry on the choices we made at each point in time and the reasons why we did so. Uh, thank you. And there are reports today around the procurement of personal protective equipment on uh, a vast inflation on the cost of individual items, for example, uh, face masks that were uh, previously pennies each are now into the pounds each. Is this an experience that the Welsh Government has gone through when buying personal protective equipment? Yeah, it's undoubtedly the case that the change in the international market and the much greater competition uh, and demand has meant that the price has gone up. And we've absolutely seen that. And just a few weeks ago, you'll recall that in one of these press conferences, I said that PPE was my number one priority and anxiety because both the supply had reduced and the cost had gone up. And we did have a couple of items where we only had about a week or so left, uh, a stock left here in Wales. Now, we never ran out, but we are definitely spending more, not just because we're buying more PPE, but because the cost has gone up. And it's part of the reason why we need to reconsider for the future the balance in what we procure overseas in PPE terms and what we want to produce here from this country. Because this isn't a short-term change to the market. We're not going to see the sunny disappear in the next few weeks. We're talking about many, many months ahead where the PPE requirements that we set out in our guidance will continue to exist. So the balance will need to change in what we buy from overseas and what we create here in Wales from our own businesses. And I remain very grateful to those companies that have shifted manufacture to help us all in this great national effort. Thank you, Mike. I've now got Rob Taylor from Wrexham.com. Good afternoon. Uh, yesterday, the First Minister said that we might just be reaching the peak in North Wales and that the peak has passed further south. Mm. Has that peak been identified due to more testing taking place in North Wales and perhaps, if you like, more man-made? Or is it a more real new concern based on non-public data, such as hospital admissions and the like? Well, there are two things, as you identify. On the one hand, when you undertake more testing, you're likely to un understand a greater level of people who have coronavirus. But actually, for us, in many ways, the levels of hospital admissions are an even more important indicator because that shows you the level of harm that's potentially being caused in an area and the pressure on our health and care system. You remember right at the start of all of this, when we went into lockdown and we were talking about uh, staying at home, saving lives and protecting the NHS, that's because we were really concerned that the NHS could be overwhelmed and the sort of dignity in care, but also the ability for the health service to treat people and to help to save the lives of those people could have been overwhelmed. Now, in North Wales, we don't expect the system to be overwhelmed, but it is at a different level in, if you like, the curve of the pandemic to other places of Wales. But it is still the case that the amount of coronavirus per head is at a lower rate in North Wales than all of the South Wales health boards in the South East. So Cardiff and Vale, Cumtaf McGonagh and an Iron Bevan have still had many more cases per head of their population. But we continue to look at what's happening in North Wales. And it's why the messages we're giving about stay home and if you do need to go out for one of the permitted reasons, stay local and stay safe are still so important. Thanks. Uh, Professor Green, the Chief Executive of Care England, told the Health Select Committee this morning that despite what other people have said in England, there were cases of people who were symptomatic being discharged into care homes. Now, I know you mentioned that there will be future backward-looking inquiries, but you did mention about the here and now. For the here and now, are you aware of that happening in Wales as well? I'm not aware that symptomatic people were discharged out of hospital into care homes. It was always the case that symptomatic people in a hospital setting should have been tested. Now, we'll learn more, as I say, in looking back. But in terms of where we are in the here and now, we've had a clear policy position since the 22nd of April that people, whether they are symptomatic or not, should be tested before discharge, and the test should be current, so that the care home sector have the confidence in knowing that that negative result is a current one, not an historic one. And we understood the importance of doing that to make sure that our whole system didn't uh, simply collapse in on itself. You could have had people not being discharged, and that would have been bad for the individual to be in the wrong place 
for their care to continue. And in normal times, we talk about delayed transfers of care as a real mischief and a real problem for individuals. We want to make sure that the flow in our system still continues so people can leave a hospital when it's no longer the right environment for their care to return to their own home, including if that home is a care home, but with the confidence that they have a current negative test for coronavirus. Uh, thank you, Rob. I've now got Gareth Exendry from the Caffili Observer. Dear Health Minister, um, follow up on Adam's question on the loss of taste and smell as a symptom. First Minister said yesterday we should feel fortunate with such a robust system in the UK that time can be taken to be precise and definitive on such matters. But in the meantime, other countries have been reporting loss of taste and smell as a symptom for quite some time. Is there not a concern that taking the cautious approach on this is not in the interest of public safety and that in this period, hundreds of people have been potentially walking around with the virus who should have been isolated? Well, actually, our, our basket of uh, potential symptoms of coronavirus has always encouraged more people uh, than are likely to have the, the, the virus to come in to be tested. So actually we're getting in a, quite a wide basket of people to come forward for testing. And it's important that chief medical officers are able to advise uh, freely and frankly ministers in each of the four national governments within the UK. And I certainly don't think that our chief medical officer, Frank Atherton, has ever held back on frank advice that he thinks he needs to give to ministers about how to keep the public safe. Now, we'll again be able to look about how and why different chief medical officers and their equivalents in other countries have made different choices. Uh, but I just don't think it's right for me as a minister to try to criticise our chief medical officers and our chief scientific advisers for not getting to a different position. My job as a minister is to consider their advice, and it's my job as a minister then to decide, and that's what I'll continue to do. And then on elderly and vulnerable people who are currently shielding, many have been isolating now for months with little or no social contact. Uh, many don't have access to online resources that keep them connected with vital social groups and organisations at the centre of their lives. For vulnerable and elderly people, how can you reassure them that this isn't going to become the norm indefinitely? Well, I think this goes back to some of the points that Tulare Glynn uh, was also, Tulare Glynn Jones was also asked at the start, and about the challenge in isolation, because as the First Minister set out yesterday, one of the real difficulties with lockdown is that whilst it has definitely helped to prevent a further spread of coronavirus with all the harm that would have done, lockdown itself isn't harm-free. And in particular for people who are missing human contact, from friends and family in particular, it is really painful and difficult. And I'm sure that journalists who are asking questions today, just as me and other people who are making choices, feel some of that ourselves as well. And it's not just for older people, of course. There are plenty of younger people um, who are missing contact. If you're in a single parent family, for example, then you could feel particularly isolated or even in a uh, and, and a family of, uh, of more than one parent or in an even larger household, then actually to be cut off from other people is really difficult. And so it's part of the forbearance we continue to ask people in words, and also part of the reason why we'll continue to review the evidence that's available to us about when we can take further steps and what those further steps should be to allow people to be able to circulate more widely and have more contact with friends and family. But we need to make sure that in doing so, we're not further risking harm to those people and the communities that they live in. So it's a difficult balance. And I, like I said, I think the publication of the scientific advice that we're receiving on a regular basis will help to inform the public of that. But again, it's our job as ministers to decide and then explain why we're making those choices and the path we're on to try to leave lockdown. Thank you, Gareth. The final question is Tom Magna from Carers World Radio. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. You referred earlier on to your test and trace trials uh, across four health authorities in Wales. Uh, you've also discussed a little bit of the Isle of Wight app, if I could call it that. How much attention are you paying to the security and use of any data captured in, in any of this work? Uh, it's a regular concern for us. It's been part of the conversations we've had between ministers across the four governments about the privacy of that data and the security of it. Uh, and so it's a regular point we'll return to. I've also had questions that are in exactly this nature from uh, politicians in my own party, uh, local constituents, and others too. So we, of course, take the privacy and the security of that data seriously. Uh, and that's, it again, going to be balanced with the risk that it entails in storing data, even on your phone, uh, 
that it then doesn't su isn't supposed to transfer until you get an alert that asks you and you still have to agree to share that data. But the benefit potentially of using that information to help to keep you and people you've been in contact with safe, as well as other people who you may not know, and that point about trying to break the chains of transmission. So the test, trace, protect approach we're trying to take is really important for all of us. We need to balance that together with people's concerns about how data is being used. You, you refer to balance, so if I could explore this a little further. Um, patient information is protected in law. Uh, that law allows the use of exceptional powers, but also says that rights must be protected as mm -hmm. well. The Information Commissioner appears to have given what to many people seems a straightforward green light to the use of uh, uh, these data uh, sources in relation to COVID-19. Uh, and what our viewers are telling us is they want to see a balance uh, in favour of their rights. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, we're of course taking people's rights really seriously. So you have to agree to not just to download the app if you're going to, but then to agree to share information uh, when your phone receives an alert. So actually there are points that are built in about how people still make choices. None of the four governments in the UK are requiring people to download the app and to use it. We're still relying on people making choices for themselves and their community. Because as we move to test, trace, protect, as we hope to be able to further remove some of the lockdown measures in that deliberate and cautious manner, we'll be relying on people to tell us when they have got symptoms, to follow the advice, to make use of the website we'll have, to help them understand their symptoms, to request a test if they need it, and to stay at home and to follow the rules on self-isolation if that's what they should do both before they have a test and get a result, and including if they're, of course, positive. Because if we don't do that, then we may find ourselves moving back into lockdown with the real impact that will have on people. And as we know, and as I said earlier, lockdown isn't harm-free. There are still real challenges in it. So I look forward to the public continue to behave in the way they have done overwhelmingly in supporting the approach we're taking here in Wales, to following the rules on lockdown, and then helping us all to move out of lockdown together. Many thanks for your questions. I look forward to seeing you again next week.